background, uh, I've been at the Institute for about uh, 20 years, and uh, the Institute has always had an kind of ambivalent relationship with faith. It used to be called the Aspen Institute of Humanistic Values. Uh, and for, a, uh, for an institution that delves deeply into the core values that motivate people's position about what constitutes the good society or the core values that motivate people's positions on what makes for good public policy, it had an oddly ambivalent uh, relationship with faith. And I say this as somebody who ran a short-lived faith and public policy program at the Aspen Institute. Uh, and so um, we're particularly <laughs> intrigued by the opportunity to have Congressman Ellison talk about his own faith journey and how it influences his values, and in particular how faith might in this current highly divided and highly polarized, I think it is fair to say, Congress, uh, how his faith permits him at times to find and touch the core values in others who may not share the same faith as he, but who share some common values that are perhaps motivated by their faith, how we might use that as a way to reach across the aisle and create uh, more bipartisan comity uh, on issues. And here to co-moderate and, uh, and introduce uh, the congressman are, are a couple of uh, uh, formers, as they say, um, uh, but still, uh, still distinguished, yet still distinguished uh, uh, former members of Congress. Uh, uh, congressman Dan uh, Glickman, former congressman and former secretary of agriculture, now the executive director of the Aspen Institute's congressional program and former Congressman uh, Mickey Edwards, a longtime congressman from the great state of Oklahoma, uh, who now runs our fiercely, uh, devotedly bipartisan uh, Rodell Fellowship and is deeply committed to thinking about how this republic can uh, be better governed and, uh, 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 and how we can better choose and better cultivate uh, uh, political leaders who will uh, live out that spirit of commitment to the, to the republic and its betterment. So uh, two wonderful gentlemen to moderate and throw out the initial questions to Congressman Ellison after he speaks about his book, uh, and then lots of wonderful people here to ask further questions. Uh, all of that said, uh, we need to conclude at about 5.30 so the Congressman can, uh, can make it back to Capitol Hill in time to uh, vote, which apparently they require you to do or they expect you yeah. to do. Yeah, it's kind of, kind well, of part of the job. job. Requirement. So, uh, Dan Glickman uh, to introduce uh, Keith Ellison and then over to all of you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. It's a real joy to have Keith here. I, thinking years ago there was a comedian, a Russian comedian named Yako Shmirnov. Yep. I don't know if you yep. remember him or not. And his whole thing was, what a country, what a country. And I'm just thinking about myself, what a country. We have a, a congressman from the Muslim faith, uh, the first African American, the first Muslim congressman it's in the history of our republic, yep. being surrounded and interrogated by two Jewish congressmen from the Midwest, you know. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, or for, well, it'll, it'll for, be all right. Yeah, yeah, trust, yeah. trust us, you got the right guys here. Yeah. Uh, uh, no but, uh, you know, in a, in a sense, you know, we share a, not in any sense the same level of depth of your struggle, but uh, we both come from areas where there is a, a infinitesimal amount of people of our religious faith, Oklahoma and Kansas. Um, uh, still not sure how our ancestors <laughs> came there, but uh, uh, any event. Uh, but reading this book, My Country Tis of Thee, I really do recommend it to everybody here. It's a great, it's a great American story is what it is. Um, uh, and with a lot of courage, a lot of tenacity. Um, the, the Detroit experience, my wife's from Detroit, went to Mumford High School. Uh, I went to school in Ann Arbor, sure. um, uh, you know, but uh, the story about your mother and father and the interesting impact they had on your life, their life, your life, and and the commitment to hard work and perseverance. And I loved reading about your dad, uh, you know, uh, no nonsense fellow. Uh, oh, yeah. And and the nature of this really strong family, siblings that you had, and that you've carried that forward. And then, and then your your struggle, uh, your personal struggles, your commitment to uh, a new faith uh, that you were not born into. The uh, involvement as a lawyer, successful lawyer, state legislator, and, and now a congressman who has co-founded the Progressive Caucus. And, uh, and I inquired about you, and I must tell you that everybody I ask says, he's a really good guy, you know, so I don't know what that means, but it's better <laughs> than the opposite. So uh, Keith, Mickey, and I are delighted to uh, have you here, and uh, why don't you go ahead and make a few comments, and I'll turn it over to Mickey for 
questions to begin. Well, Dan, thank you. Mickey, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I have to say that, um, you know, the Aspen Institute does many great things for members of Congress. Um, and I can tell you that your uh, morning presentations on a multitude of issues is an invaluable resource. And um, you, I don't know if you've noticed, but I mean, whenever the, there's a hot issue, whether it's Syria, nowadays Russia, whatever it is, you know, you see your, you know, there's, there's way more people there than there are seats. And because we just need to know, because you all are literally giving us the information we rely on to make decisions. Uh, and particularly in areas where we're not, some of us are not experts because we're not on the Committee of Jurisdiction. So I do thank you for that. And I thank you for the work that you do uh, on some of the events that you have around the world. And uh, please keep it up uh, because, you know, as a member of Congress, you may be, we come from various walks of life, as you too well know. Uh, but um, we're called upon to make decisions about everything. You ask me about, you know, criminal justice. I know that because I was a lawyer who worked in that area. You ask me about telecom, I don't know that. And so we need people who can help us get information, digest it in a quick way. Uh, I thought I might just read a little. Sure. What do you think? Go for it. That makes yeah. sense? So I wrote the book because um, after a uh, guy who I call a friend of mine, Peter King, uh, who was the chair of the Homeland Security Committee, uh, decided to have a hearing on uh, Muslim r violent radicalization in the United States, in the United States. Uh, I went to Peter and I said, Peter, um, certainly there's Muslims who the Muslim community is not bragging about. Uh, so if you need to have a hearing that features someone who is uh, promoting violent extremism, even if they're Muslim, I have no problem with that. But what about the Timothy McVeighs? What about the other extremists? Let's, let's make sure we talk about violent extremism in all its forms and manifestations and ideologies and motivations. He said, nope, we're talking about Muslims. And, not a, and after that, we're gonna talk, do one on Muslims at radicalization in prison, and we're gonna do one about Somali community, and we're gonna keep it up. So I said, look, man, uh, that's, that's really a problem. We shouldn't be doing this. He said, okay, I do you, I'll do you a solid, Keith. You can testify, but that's about all I can do. We're gonna do it, and there it is. So like when he offered me the chance to testify, I, I thought, well, why don't, wait a minute, do I, do I sort of ratify or validate this hearing by participating? And on the other side, I thought, well, they're gonna do the hearing whether I participate or not, so why not get, get a word in? Well, after talking to some people, I decided to participate. And that turns out to be something I believe in deeply on multiple fronts, be part of the conversation. Simply not participating because you think that you'll give your stamp of approval to something you don't approve of, you generally does not stop what you don't think is the right thing. And, uh, you know, you, and then you forego an opportunity to include another voice. So I, went, so I wrote up my testimony and I got ready. And the night before the, te the hearing, there was a lot of anticipation. I had been interviewed uh, throughout the week, been on Fox, been on CNN, all this stuff talked to O'Reilly and Blitzer and all those guys all about these upcoming hearings. And so the day comes or the night comes right before the hearing and I read out what I was gonna say to a few friends of mine on a conference call and one of them says, well Keith, if you're gonna mention Mohammed Salman Hamdani, who's a 23 year old kid who lost his life, you sure better call his mother because she's driving down from New York and she plans on being there herself. So, I took that advice and I thought it'd be a five minute call. Yeah, Miss, I'm Donnie, I'm gonna be talking about your son tomorrow. <coughs> Just so thought I'd let you know, bye. No, the call ended up being about an hour where this mom talked tenderly about her, her son, about how he uh, loved Star Wars so much he had on the back of his car in a license plate, Young Jedi, about how he, he played, uh, you know, he's from Pakistan, so you would think they're playing cricket football, with, you know, the kind we play. He wore number 79, she still had his jersey. And she talked about how the, the pain she felt after the 9-11, how she didn't know where he was. And then New York Post got up and was saying, well, maybe he's associated with the bad guys. And so she talked about the, just the anguish she felt. She felt about the relief she felt when they did say that he was found. And they said he was a hero. But she'd never forget you know, how 
she was struggling to make sure that he was listed among the first responders and the real heroes of the day. So I got off the phone that night, didn't sleep well, got up in the morning, walked in, and both of you know the scene, you know, sometimes there's hearings where there's a sea of cameras, jammed up room, no space, you're climbing over people just to get to the table. I dreamed of those kind of hearings. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so I'm sitting at the table and uh, Frank Wolf goes ahead of me. I was glad he did. And then John Dingle goes and he represents the largest uh, Arab Muslim population in the country. And then I went. My testimony started out very uh, almost academic, you know, I'm talking about efforts to reach out, efforts to build trust, and talking about how what we need to do is not identify the community as, and look at it through a security lens, but really have meaningful connection between the U.S. You know, uh, law enforcement and the Muslim community because this community will be the ones who are gonna, who are gonna help you understand you know, uh, who, who the threats are, who, was, who are not the threats, and how to really connect in that Muslims are uh, 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 patriotic, loyal Americans. It's a very academic sort of discussion. And then I started talking about this 23-year-old this kid who, when the glass was falling and the smoke was rising and people were absolute panic-stricken, um, how he ran to the scene and uh, ended up dying, giving his life to save fellow Americans. And I lost it. I don't know if you all remember it, but I could feel my tongue getting thicker and the warm tears falling down my cheeks. I started to feel embarrassed. I wanted to disappear, but I kept reading. I knew I had to, uh, and, and when I was done, I got up and I, uh, I, I left. And I was like, wow, I really, really blew that. I meant to try to do some good, I, I just, and then his mom grabbed me and hugged me like I couldn't even breathe the woman hugged me so hard. And she said that you helped bring my son's story to life. And um, it was one of the most touching moments I've had in, as, as a public servant. And, uh, and, uh, and then Simon and Schuster called and asked me to write a book. So I, I, I still wasn't convinced that I should write one. I said, like, yeah, I'm busy, I got a lot of things to do. But then they pitched and said, look, you know, our country has, has, has been outraged that there was going to be a Catholic president. Uh, our country has gone through, you know, I remember growing up in Detroit, and I did, I did not live through the time that Father Coughlin was doing what he did, but he was on the airwaves talking about the Jewish menace and stuff like this. You all who know about the history know it. What I'm saying is true. And our country... Give, given our commitment to the first, the first clause of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law establishing a religion nor abridging the free exercise thereof. You know, we have this tremendous commitment to religious tolerance. And we have a form of secularism which I believe, and I say humbly, is superior to the type they practice in Europe. Because in France they say nobody can have a religious symbol. In America, we say, bring all your religious symbols. In America, we'll have Juma prayers on Friday under the Capitol Dome. But that's no big deal because they have a Bible study on Thursday morning. I'm sure if some Jews wanted to have a minion, nobody would have a problem with that. My point is, even despite our commitment to religious tolerance, we still have these fights every now and again over religion in America. And I thought that this, and they convinced me that this would, it would be a, a decent idea to talk about an American story of a typical American congressperson or, uh, and, 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 and their, their journey walking through, uh, through, this, uh, through public service at a time of, uh, of, of tumultuousness uh, regarding religion. You said this is an American story. Boy, you nailed it. I believe that's absolutely right. So anyway, let me just read just a little bit and uh, here we go. <clears throat> On September 11, 2011, the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we held an observance in Minnesota. We were standing on the steps of the state capitol, singing songs and honoring our first responders. I stood there thinking, 10 years later, how have we responded to wars, a doubling of our military budget? We've seen an increase in anti-Islamic hatred, We've prevented a number of new terrorist attacks, but 
have we really made ourselves safer as a people? Maybe we need to understand what safety means. There was an impulse in the aftermath of 9-11 to ask the question, why do they hate us? That was a gut level emotional response and probably not the right question. The word they is too broad because only a very small minority of radical, violent individuals perpetrated these terrorist acts. But to take a step back, we would serve ourselves better to ask, who are they and how and, and why do they recruit others to their cause? We tend to look externally for answers. Some in power assumed that the proper response was to double our military spending and plunge into war. We know that we can bomb a training camp, but going to war without a clear understanding of how to win or how to exit is akin to throwing water on a grease fire. We needed to smother this fire, but how do we smother it when you don't really know why it burns? How do we deny terrorists access to their power base? The truth is, there were a number of things we could have done. There are a number of things we should do as a nation. We should have engaged with all of our international partners and not just a few. Perhaps convene an international conference on how to undermine terrorist outfits and regimes. We should re-energize our efforts to bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians, an effort that, John, that Secretary of State John Kerry began again in 2013. We need to intensify the peace process and to make it the centerpiece of our policy. In addition, we should do more to develop resources of renewable energy right here in America so that we would be less dependent on imported oil. We should speak more in the United Nations and organize for human rights. Repression breeds resistance. That resistance isn't always dem democratic and peaceful. Sometimes it's violent and intolerant. There are more things we should have done. In The Looming Tower, Al-Qaeda and the Road to 9-11, Pulitzer Prize winning author Lawrence Wright notes that bin Laden knew his terrorist network couldn't go toe to toe with the United States militarily. But what it could do was to draw us into the kind of fight that we couldn't eventually win. One in which we would end up involving people who had nothing to do with the initial attack. Al-Qaeda was hoping that we would hurt civilians, which, could then, which it could then use as a recruiting tool. See, they droned you, they killed your family, the great Satan, join us. Some of our actions, like military occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan, gave the terrorists more recruiting arguments, a dilemma that US soldiers have had to deal with. We spent trillions of dollars in Iraq and Afghanistan on this war on terror, and what did it get us in return? Over 6,000 uh, Americans dead and tens of thousands wounded, hundreds of thousands of civilians killed and wounded, uh, millions made homeless. How much of this carnage and tragedy could have been avoided if we would have focused on bringing the true enemies to justice? It's time we start thinking about how to move forward. I think the United States is now in a place of reflection where we can take a moment and truly ask ourselves if we acted properly following 9-11, especially as it relates to invading Iraq and staying in Afghanistan as long as we did. We must have the courage to admit that Iraq was a colossal failure. The justification to invade Iraq was 100% wrong. Yes, we got rid of Saddam Hussein, but he had nothing to do with 9-11. Was he a bad guy? Extremely. But we work with bad guys every day. Where do we draw the line? I don't see us going into Russia and getting rid of Vladimir Putin. I don't see us getting rid of leaders in China. Both Russia and China have committed human rights atrocities. North Korea brutally represses its people and actually is developing weapons of mass destruction and threatening its neighbors with war. Should we invade that country and replace its government? There you go. Okay. So, my friend Mickey Edwards. Well, first of all, uh, a personal note, Keith. My, uh, my, my son is a lawyer in Minneapolis and voted for you. And is, <laughs> del and is delighted that you're here, uh, just as I am. Give him my best. Um, uh, several years ago when I was um, uh, in Congress, I was invited to go to Chicago to keynote uh, a meeting of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination League to talk about how they could become more involved and play a, a bigger role uh, in the political world. I'm sure some were Muslim, some were, were of other faiths. But 
it always raised the question that as well as you know what I see from the churches in my old district and, and watching people uh, in, uh, in Congress today about where faith actually, uh, you, you address this in your book, uh, how much you carry your faith into the actual decision making process when you're voting on the various issues that come before Congress. And I thought you were very articulate in the, in the book about that, so, uh, and I, everybody here hasn't read that yet, so uh, w would you address that question about wh where does faith come into actually affecting what you do when you're ca called on to vote on a national issue? How, how do you do that? Well, you know, Mickey, it's a great question. I mean, we're all looking at what the Supreme Court's gonna do in the Hobby Lobby case raising real serious questions about the line between faith and governance. For me, I think it's perfectly legitimate to look at the core values of my faith, which happen to be quite universal, uh, and, um, and, and bring those to bear in my decision making. But when it comes to prescribing unique features of my faith on others, things that are not universally shared across faith lines, I think we start running into trouble. So every faith I know speaks in terms of feeding the hungry, speaks in terms of telling the truth, speaks in terms of uh, inclusion. Uh, I can quote from the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran on, on passages that speak to all these things, even welcoming the stranger all, there, there are reasons, there are, think, there are scriptural texts which could support a value system about all the things that we've talked about. But what about when it comes to telling an individual who may not share your belief uh, who they can marry, uh, what they should, can do with re their reproductive choices? I think that we start running into trouble. Now these are always gonna be naughty issues. But at the end of the day, the individual carries uh, the right of religious liberty. Not, uh, the, the state should not be able to impose its value. The state can't have religion. One of the things I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation is how in the United States, Congress, that's us, shall make no law. Didn't say shall make some law. <laughs> Said none. Nor shall it abridge the free exercise thereof. In essence, religion is for the people to decide. And I think that it's interesting because you look around the world and some states want to, and I don't mean states like the United States, but countries, want to uh, prescribe religious um, religion on their, on their citizens. And sometimes they think that it'll help promote, I don't know, better behavior. But you know, the United States has plenty of religious, we're pretty religious in the United States. I mean, you could find a church or a mosque or a synagogue nearly anywhere, and so it hasn't hurt religion that we have freedom of religion, but uh, it certainly has made uh, it, it made Americans have more choices as to how they seek the divine. Uh, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the president and and the the just the very very divisive feelings there are about him in the country. Years ago, when I was in Congress, I went up to Canada. And uh, there was a fellow named Jean Chrétien. He was, the he was the leader of the opposition party, later yeah. became prime minister. But at the time, he said his, if his name was John Christian, he would have been prime minister already. <laughs> but the fact that he was Jean Chrétien couldn't get elected west of Quebec. Right. Um, now, here we have a president who is a professed Christian. Yep. And yet, it does seem to me that a lot of hostility against him is not so much that he's an African American as that he is perceived as a person who believes in the Islamic faith because of his name and because of his background. Do you agree with that? Or, or how would you assess this, the polarization that exists out there uh, uh, about him in so many circles? You know, um, this is a great question, and I appreciate you asking. But I do remember Bill Clinton uh, having to deal with Whitewater, having to deal, they were saying that he was taking, he was landing flights in Arkansas, moving drugs around. There was all types of far-fetched, far-flung stuff around uh, Clinton. 
I do sense that the vitriol may be even more intense with Obama, but, but I don't think any president can escape a lot of, uh, of, of negative uh, sentiment. I mean, as a politician, you get credit for things that you didn't do, and you get blamed for things that you didn't do. And, you, and, you know, and, 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 and of course, the opposite's true as well. But, so, so I'm not, all, I mean, it's difficult for me to say, okay, how is Obama really different now? The, all this stuff about him being a Muslim. I mean, to be a Muslim, you have to say that there's no God but God, and Muhammad is his messenger. That, that's what makes, he, and he doesn't say that. So it's simple, <laughs> you know what I mean? And yet they won't, they won't, uh, they won't stop with that, that, that talk. You know, sometimes, I gotta be honest with you, I sometimes feel that they're using this Muslim um, name as sort of a dog whistle for racial things. That's my own take. I mean, uh, I mean, look, you know, when, when uh, it, I mean, it goes back a long ways in our country. And, uh, you know, the South flipped from one party to the other within a generation, all based on uh, conferring civil rights on black people. That's a fact, right? So the South used to be solidly democratic, you know, sometime in the 60s uh, between Kennedy and Johnson. Um, within a generation that flips completely and the, and the thing that made the difference was empowerment of Americans who were 14 generations in this country. How, how much more American can you be than an African American, right? I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, uh, most African Americans will trace their roots on American soil far before people who immigrated from, say, Poland or Eastern Europe. I mean, I, I think that I'm factually supported by making that claim. Um, so, and, and, and so the, the, the level of, I mean, our country is clearly less racist than it used to be, clearly more acceptance among all Americans than there was in the past. I mean, Obama won Iowa, right? Pretty white state. But yet there is this core that just, you know, and when they say things like, this is our country, we want to take our, they have a very specific concept of what they're talking about. Who's an American? Who belongs? Who's a part? And, um, you know, you, you, all you are familiar with the recently released Lee Atwater quote, who knows what I'm talking about? Nobody. Well, Lee Atwater, uh, recently in 1981, and he was talking to people about dog whistle politics. And this is a near quote. You should Google this. I'm advising you to Google this. It, it said, he starts, he said, Lee Atwater says, well, when you start out in 1954 saying in, 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 you know what I mean by the N-word, of mm -hmm. course. He says, by 1968, you can't say that because it hurts you, so you got to be a little more abstract. So you got to say busing. You got to say stuff like that. By 1970, now you're saying cut government spending, and people kind of know that who needs government support more, so they're, they, get, they get what you're talking about without you having to say it. Next thing you know, you're waving Willie Horton uh, around, and it's clear to everybody what you mean, but you haven't said it, so nobody can accuse you, right? So with the president, I think that there is this core Nobody, you can't say what you want to say about the president, <laughs> but you can sort of like wink and nod and a certain group of people know what you mean, you know? And um, they act on that. So I'm not certain that it has to do with Obama being, I mean, look, you know, uh, I'm not certain, I don't know if it has to do with, how much it has to do with religion. You know, um, I, think it, I, think it's, I think we're dealing with more familiar monsters than that. So, um, I mean, this is very quick. You don't even have to respond to it. I just want to make this observation and we want to get questions from them. But one of the things I was struck at when, when I was reading your book, I thought Jackie Robinson, and the reason I thought it was this, it was because when, when I read the way you reacted to some of the people who were making these pretty bad comments about you when you came into the Congress, was that you didn't take the bait. That uh, you, you have examples in there when somebody would say something you know, pretty awful to you, and, and you would invite them to lunch. And, and so I just wanted to comment that, that your reaction to the attacks on you, I thought, spoke a lot 
uh, about when, when you talk then about trying to bring people together. Uh, it, uh, it spoke a lot, but you don't need to respond to that if you don't want. I was just going to. Yeah. But do you mind if I just say very yeah. quickly because I know I answered too long. I'm sorry about that. Um, I had a lot of help. You know, uh, like so when I, I didn't know Debbie Wasserman Schultz from anyone, but she walks up to me, she says, how you doing? I'm Debbie Wasserman Schultz from Florida. And when I swore in, I swore on the Tanakh, and a bunch of people got on my case about it. I got through it, you'll get through it, welcome to Congress. Yeah. And so, yeah. and, and you know, so the night before, you know, the, so, the, so the, we all, the freshman class, you know, there's the day before we're gonna swear in, so Nancy Pelosi has this dinner, and I didn't know Nancy. I, didn't, I did not, I was not a Washington political before I ran for Congress. I'd been to Washington about three or four times in my whole life before I got to Congress. And uh, so Nancy Pelosi, I'm thinking like, wow, you know, Virgil Good has said all this stuff, there's all this stuff about the Quran, all this, all this stuff, man. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm sort of wondering, are these people gonna see me as a liability? I'm not sure what's gonna happen. She says, Mr. Ellison, would you mind offering a blessing for our, our meal? So I. So it was right at the beginning. Right? right at the beginning. So I stand up and I do the best I can. <laughs> I'm not a preacher. Uh, and, I, and I sit down and she says, see, and I just want to let you know that uh, this is a prayer much like any one of us would give because it was the elephant in the room. And, uh, and I just, we just want to welcome you to the Congress, Mr. Ellison. Thank you. We went on and had some chicken or something. So, I mean, True. so I was welcomed in a very <laughs> warm way, not only by Democrats, by the way. A lot of Republicans walked up, shook hands. So the bad stuff was uh, there, but there was a lot of good stuff, too. I also would say, for those of you who read the first few chapters of the book, you had a most fascinating mother and father. Oh, yeah, there's something And else. character comes from from the generation that precedes you. And you obviously got good character and how your parents were. So let's open it up for questions, comments, thoughts. If you could say who you are. Got to be a question here. Come on. I see somebody making their way. Yes, right here. OK, well, let's say this gentleman for, oh, no, right here. Oh, he's, he's the man with the. Uh, Microphone. If you could state your name too, if possible. Uh, my name is Cynthia Walker, um, Representative Ellison. Thank you very much for speaking here. Um, I have not read the book, um, and I would be grateful if you would very briefly uh, just say something about your mother and father, because as a antique myself, um, I do feel that parents are rather important. Thank you. Well, thanks for asking about them. Um, you know, my my uh, my mom was raised in Natchitoches, Louisiana. Uh, on a farm on a place called Cane River Lake. They call it Cane River Lake because it used to be a river connected to the Red River, but then it got cut off, and so it was just this long, long, long river-looking lake. So she grew up there, and uh, they farmed. She grew up in segregated South. Every day, uh, she, she, they lived on the farm, but they also lived in the city, and when she they had a little house there because her father taught industrial arts, Every day she would walk past this old, uh, this old statue. And if you want to Google Uncle Jack, you should do so because Uncle Jack was a black man tipping his hat and there was an inscription on this statue she walked past every day which said, to the faithful darkies of, <laughs> of the, in, in, uh, in memory of the faithful darkies of Louisiana. So this, she walked past that every day. My mother grew up where they wouldn't let him try on the clothes. She drew, grew up, when she went to Xavier, which is a HBCU, a black college in New Orleans, um, they, uh, they, she told me they used to take the, the signs off the bus, the whites only signs, and put them in their bag, and then run away, and the, you know. My mother was that, but my mother was, was, grew up in a very loving environment, people who supported her in every single way. Her father was uh, organizing civil rights um, uh, workers and voting rights in the, late 40s, early 50s. In fact, do you all remember the whole Jena 6 thing came up a few years ago? And so I was on the Judiciary Committee and I was asking the, the, the witnesses about their views on, on this, this thing. And my mom says, you know, you got your own Jena story. I'm like, well, what do you mean? She said, well, when your grandfather would go out to the fish fries and stuff to talk to these folks 
you know, about voting, and they were all scared because if you voted, maybe the people whose land you lived on would throw you off, and that would be the least of what would happen, right? And uh, and she said, well, they pull, they used to pull trees out in the middle of the road, and then you know they'd be afraid to get out of the car because then they could you know be easier to get shot, you know, or get trapped. So they used to go back around, and they used to, and they even burned crosses in front of their house, and right in front of my mom's uh, house on, on Lee Street. Now it's Martin Luther King Boulevard. So that's the kind of person my mother. My mother grew up. She was a medical technologist. My mom's ten years younger than my father, and my dad uh, grew up in the city of Detroit, which had its own kind of way. You know, they, Detroit has an area that's known as black. Used to be known as Black Bottom. And anybody ever heard of the play? Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Mm -hmm. So, so that's you know he was born there, he was raised there, and uh, Detroit was very racially segregated, but there were no signs. He grew up there. Uh, he his parents divorced at an early age. Uh, he bounced around. My father enlisted in the United States Army um, at the age of 15, and um, was actually in the Pacific Theater in World War II, and uh, got out, finished high school somehow. Uh, and uh, then studied pharmacy, had to drop out, worked uh, in the auto plants in uh, Detroit, and then finally got out of Wayne State, and then got into University of Michigan Medical School, and then met my mom, who was, he was 32, she was 22, you know, and uh, they got married. And uh, they're both very interesting people, and I can tell you stories. My dad's flashy. My dad, needs, my dad is the kind of guy who, uh, who he's he's gonna wear the expensive suit even though he doesn't need to, right? He, you know, and, and you know, I used to like wonder about him. Like I said, Dad, why you gotta show off like that? <laughs> and I love my dad very much, and he's still, you know, he, uh, quite a character. And and he would say, you know, you don't understand. I come from an era when. They did not allow black people to have nice things. They, you just couldn't do it. Um, did anybody ever see a movie called Rosewood? Rosewood has a, is, is, is the part where Don Cheadle has a piano. Don Cheadle has a story. This is a story about, a, about how the white side of town burned down Rosewood. It was a black city, killed a bunch of people. And, and there was a scene where the, where, the, where the white folks who lived around the area said, well, that boy up there has a piano. He said, well, you, you know, so what? He says, well, the point is, you know, he has a piano and I don't have one. Can you play a piano? No, but he has a piano and I don't have one. Why should he have one? So the things that people used to harm each other over seeming petty, you know, weren't petty then. So I think that my dad sort of, for him, of being able to acquire you know, certain things literally made him feel empowered, right? Whereas they didn't mean much to my mom and they don't mean much to me. But that's the kind of guy he was. And um, he had, my father had a stroke in 95. He doesn't walk anymore. He's in a wheelchair. He, and he obviously he doesn't work. But he still watches the news very closely, has all kinds of opinions on Ukraine and where the missing plane is, and <laughs> and, co and Congress. Too? Oh, and Congress. Oh, yeah, and Congress. Right. <laughs> my father's a Republican, by the way. And your father a success, was a successful psychiatrist, my too. My father's a psychiatrist. Yep, absolutely. So those are my parents. You know, my mom still works. She's a social worker. She does juvenile sex offender group. And if you do something bad, but not violent and dangerous, but you know, like an exposure thing or something. The judge will send you to Miss Ellison, and if you behave yourself and do what she says for a, a time, you can get into pretrial diversion. And she's doing that right now in Detroit, Michigan. Well, it's Monday, so she's, she probably, she's probably wrapping up her case files right now. Yep. Dolores? Hi, I'm Dolores Fergoni. Um, my question, actually, um, you were not born into the Muslim faith. No. And I've heard you talk a lot about your family, obviously very close to them. And I'm, I'm curious about uh, how, was there an epiphany? What led you to the Muslim faith? And did it upset the apple cart in the dynamics of your family uh, as that played out? Because uh, especially with the South and 
you know, a tight-knit family, I would think that somewhere along the line, faith was important to the network of, of the family. Answer her and tell her she has to buy the book, because it's in there. Oh, yeah. okay. It's in there. You could get the real story. So, so let me tell you, though, my father was, um, he wasn't, he wasn't an atheist or an agnostic because he didn't think about religion that much. Because it takes a little thought to become an atheist or an agnostic. Yes, you have to reflect on this. He didn't, he was like, he didn't have that much time for it. My mother's Catholic, and so they, that's another way they were kind of an odd couple. And, but it worked, they still married, you know. Uh, and your brother? And my brother's a Baptist minister. And my brother never, never wears a collar, but when I was gonna be sworn in, he said, I will wear my collar and stand next to you just to show him <laughs> what's up. So, so my brother, that's my brother, Brian. Uh, and uh, so, no, that, I never had an epiphany. Let me tell you, there is a great beauty, tremendous values embedded in the Catholic faith. I read Catholic authors now. I'm a huge, fan of Joanne Chittister, uh, Sister Simone, the nuns on the bus. I just think they are awesome. But when I was going through, you know, when I was growing up, to me it was just rules. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, mostly don't, right? <laughs> and, and so to me, it, I just, when my mother stopped making us go, I stopped going. I went to an all-boys Catholic high school in Detroit called UAD High School. The, the, the motto for the school was men for others. They made us do a senior social project to work with the poor. They tried to affect my thinking, right? But somehow I just didn't get it. And I just was kind of irreligious, kind of following my father's path. But I had spiritual yearning. So I was curious about religion, curious about what it meant. The most fascinating class I had is a, when one of the priest did a book, did, made a study, the book of Mark. And he started out by saying it wasn't even written until 70 years after Jesus left this earth. And he started dissecting it. He's a priest. And I thought, wow, this is interesting, you know? But, before, but nothing else really did much for me. And I just thought the pews were hard wood, you know? <laughs> and, and so anyway, so I get to Wayne State, and a friend of mine, a uh, good friend, I mean, I'd read about Muhammad Ali, and I'd read the autobiography of Malcolm X, so I kind of associated Islam, I didn't know any Muslims, I didn't know anything about Islam, but I kind of thought that these guys were the ones who were gonna stand up and do something about it, right? And so, when I met this friend of mine named Mafta, he, we were studying, you know, calculus. Uh, I was majoring in economics, so you had to take math. And so, um, he gets up one Friday and walks, says, I, I gotta go. And they said, where are you going? Well, I'm going to pray. You want to come? Come on. So I'm 19 years old. I figured he's, he left, so I closed my book, and we went, saw, walked up to the student center. There was uh, all these shoes out there. What looked in there, and then there's these sheets on the floor. Everybody's sitting down. That's different from my Catholic upbringing. And then I heard the preacher talk about unity of mankind, how all humanity is from a single pair, male and female, and how we're all connected and kin that way. And he gave a story about how the, 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 the mission of Muhammad was one of liberation against abusive, tyrannical authority who helped people escape from slavery, from convention, from materialism, from, and I just, I went back and I went back and I went back and next thing you know, I, uh, I uh, was a Muslim, and um, my brother, see, we grew up in a Catholic household, so my, my, my brother, when he became a Baptist, that was a bigger deal. <laughs> 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 but, but my mother found out I was a Muslim over, over ham. Also in the book. Right, that's in the book. So you want to hear the, read the ham yeah, story. Yeah, read the So anyway, food, you know, bam. <laughs> yep. Let's see. Got another, yes, right up front here. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Libby Franklin, and I work here at the Institute. Nice I have sort you. of a, 
a selfishly motivated question. I'm doing some research, and I think you might be able to help me. Um, you made mention of sort of this idea of reclaiming our country or what some people may mean by what it means to be an American and who counts. And, and I'm just wondering what, what your take is on that, what it means to be an American and how that is changing or not. Um, and if it's, if it's a mindset, if it's a, if it's a set of actions, what, how you would define it? First of all, I think it's important to talk about what it does not mean to be an American. So to be a Norwegian means you probably look a certain way, eat a certain way, speak a certain language, to be French, to be, you know, Pakistani, to be Turkish. I mean, all these countries are constituted based on a cultural, historical, physiological connection between them. America is none of that. Americans are bound together based on our, our constitution uniting us in a set of common belief in the voice of the people should govern the nation, not a king, not a sultan, right? Based in the belief that, uh, that every individual has inherent dignity and their human rights must be respected. Based on the idea that being able to speak your own truth is essential as an American. And that the government, which we all buy into through our Constitution, cannot do certain things to us. There are, they have limits too. So I think to be an American means to have a, to be, to be part of a, I'll use the term tribe or nation, that, that, isn't, that isn't about phenotype, hair texture, language, I mean, pizza's an American food, right? Yeah, it is, why not? So are tacos, so is hummus. Why, why aren't they? Why wouldn't they be? Americans eat it. People who are not even of uh, so that historical lineage enjoy it. So this is a very interesting sort of arrangement for a nation. It means that no one could really say that uh, they're more American than you. I mean, you, to be an American, you could simply be born here. No matter where your parents are from, regardless as to whether they came here legally or not, makes you an American. I mean, there's something, I think, very special about it. It allows us to be able to relate to the rest of the world in a way that the rest of the world can't relate to itself. We probably have more language diversity in America than anywhere. We certainly have more ethnic diversity than any country that I'm aware of. And so, I mean, I th but, but yet at the same time, when you go abro abroad, you know, there's something distinctive about Americans, no matter what they may look like or what their orientation might be. So, I mean, America is an evolving nation. Part of our national ethos is evolution. So we, we believe in progress, right? So, you know, when America started, it wasn't good enough to be a white male to vote. That was, if that's all you were, you couldn't vote. You needed to be Protestant and you need to have some land too. Then, and be 21, then you could vote. But then the Jacksonian Revolution came and that expanded. Then the Civil War came and that expanded. Then Susan B. Anthony's uh, movement and then that expanded. And then we got rid of the poll tax. And then 18-year-olds could vote. You can, if, you can, if you can carry a gun and go to Vietnam, you ought to be able to vote. And so this, I think the idea of evolution is sort of embedded in the American psyche. And people who don't want to see the expansion of inclusion, are, that's sort of like they're not, they're not in the mainstream of the American ideal. So those are some of my ideas. Ken, I know you have to leave in a minute, but, but since we have three current and former members of Congress, and Mickey's been very active in the no-labels world, and I run the congressional program at Aspen, and tell us there's hope for the future of the legislative <laughs> process. Oh, my goodness. There's so much hope. There's a lot of hope for America. Let me tell you, that's another feature of, American, of being an American, I think. You know what shocks me whenever I deal with people abroad is when they say things like, this situation has always been like this. It's going to stay like this. You can't fix it. I'm like, well, of course you can fix it. And, P and somebody even said to me, that's a very American attitude. 
I'm like, really? I just thought that was the, I, isn't everybody this way? <laughs> I mean, Americans tend to be hopeful and optimistic. And I think we're hopeful and optimistic because we still have a First Amendment which says I can say what I want to say. And are you hopeful and optimistic about Congress? Yes, I am, because I can tell you this. I can, here's the thing about it. The problems of, of Congress, I think, do need some fixing. I think we need reform, and Americans are good at reform, right? We've got to find, in my opinion, we've got to find a way such that the average American person can participate from the standpoint of even being a donor in the American democracy. I think money has had a corrosive effect and we've gotten to an extreme point where, you know, how many people can write a $2,600 check? Very few. And yet, the people who fundraise for me want me to only talk to them. Of course, I buck that trend. But we spend hours. You all, I mean, I, you know, actually, maybe we, you talk to members who served years ago. I mean, I've heard like Udall say, his dad ran for Congress and all he needed was five grand. I'm like, whoa, if I, make, if I only get five grand in the door this week, we are in big trouble. So we've got to have the pendulum swing back the other way uh, and we've, and, and so I'm, I'm, but, but I believe Americans are up to it. I believe that Americans are well-intentioned, and I believe that at the end of the day, we are going to rise to the occasion. Because I, I have conversations every day with my Republican colleagues who disagree with me on taxes and spending and everything else, but who agree that the institution is worth it, and we've got to fight to make it reflect what it's supposed to reflect. So, I, I'm, so I'm confident we can do it. It's going to take a lot of people power. It's going to take a lot of people power. Um, and we need people to be animated about, you know, making the average American the center and the VIP of American politics again. But I think we can certainly get there. Mickey, you want to close up? Because I no, know I, that I, you know, I can't top that. I mean, I, <laughs> it, it, it is really good that you, that you have the optimism. And I think that uh, uh, you being in the house is, is one of the things that's going to make that happen. Ah, thanks, Mickey. Well, okay. we're delighted you could come here. And uh, like I said, this is a great American story that we can all be proud of. So you ought to buy the book, yeah. digest it, and also uh, recognize that, you know, you have pretty good knowledge of history. And you can't change the future without knowing the past. Hey, that's right. You know? okay. That's right. Let's buy, the, give. buy the book. Yeah. Let's <laughs> yeah, Okay. <laughs>